Camp of the Million, sorry, Camp of the Millennium without the ill. And I and you. Ill, I and you. So this is again Jack Isatali's book Millennium, Winners and Losers in the Coming World Order. Written in 1991, but that's no matter. It was a prediction of the future of the new millennium as it was uh, appearing in 1991. And uh, if you've read Brave New World or 1984, um, you won't be turned off by the date of publication because you'll realize that the individual releasing this information is um, is worth listening to. So, uh, <clears throat> the last video I did a summary of the coming world order, uh, the first 14 pages, where it talks about the changes in the new millennium, how Japan and Europe may take over the United States, how there is going to be a divide between the rich nomads and the poor nomads. Uh, there will still be violence, but it will mostly be uh, done economically now, in this millennium. America's, uh, America's war is just a grandstanding before its eventual collapse. Or it's an obvious collapse, it's debt, and so forth. And economic power is going away from America, but it's going towards Europe and Pacific. In Europe, they mean uh, basically EU and Pacific, they mean Japan, but also including, you know, all the Asian countries and even America. Because America is part of the Pacific and uh, the West Coast especially is heavily involved in the trade with, uh, with Japan and China. Then they talked about the reign of the market and how the market capitalism has taken over and it's going to be the new control factor of the future. Um, and yeah, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, marketing going on to make people desire this great... I mean, it doesn't take marketing. I mean, who doesn't want to be flying in airplanes and, um, you know, or driving the best cars or going on these uh, tropical vacations and so forth um so anyway but there is going to be winners and losers and most are going to be just uh staring at this grand prosperity uh jealously and few are going to enjoy the fruits of the labors of the losers So yeah, he's talking about the Pacific Sphere and European Sphere right here and where they're located according to his prediction. And yeah, it's not, it's going to be a hyper-industrial new economic order where services are going to be transformed into mass-produced consumer goods using the innovations of technology and uh, reducing all the uh, labor and so forth. So it's all going to be done technologically, but people are just going to be the robotic managers of these technologies. But he doesn't really mention that, but he does mention how the microchip and the advances in biotechnology and genetic engineering are preparing the way for a revolutionary leap into a new age, which will profoundly transform human culture. So we're already seeing how microchip has changed our society dramatically. And biotechnology and genetic engineering, we mainly only hear in protests. So I guess uh, they haven't gotten everything they want yet uh, in that field. Um, so, yeah. Um, thankfully, there's still protests going on against this about, uh, about people trying to make human-animal eye hybrids and uh, changing all our plants and adding genes in our plants to produce chemicals which weren't normally in the plant and so forth, so it's not good. And he also warns about, um, you know, using this genetic engineering to play God. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, microchip-based technologies that opened the way for... Um, basically change of our life, industrialization of all the services, and um, they're going to be nomadic objects of the future, which we already see, which is how I'm making this video. And uh, yeah, so they will change the world, 
but they will also give great things to individuals, but they will also destroy their uh, kind of uh, things they've gotten used to, or human things that are necessary for our psychological uh, fulfillment, really, like certainties of home and uh, home and community are gone, especially for the rich nomads who um, crave for human contact, whereas the poor nomads crave for all the, um, or just the escape from the dull uh, existence while always being told that there is this great world out there full of all these uh, dreams and uh, wonders. Basically like Brave New World and how the savage felt. <laughs> Although the sav savage kind of snapped out of it, um, most people won't. Anyway, so uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, I just uh, end up talking too much. So six minutes already passed and can't make it uh, go more than 30 minutes. So um, he, now he talks about the uh, privileged nations. Everyone will not be rich and so forth. There will always be the divide of winners and losers. And um, what else? He's saying how the North is going to get richer even though it's going to move from America to Europe and to uh, Japan and China, but um, still, the uh, North overall is going to be richer than the South because of these trends of the market and industrialization, and therefore the poor South is going to get poorer, and the people mostly there are going to be the worst of the losers who are going to be in restless despair and hopeless and uh, tempted and enraged, and so they'll try to... Uh, revolt and uh, war against the north and they'll try to take uh, try to cross the new Berlin Wall aka the Trump Wall which was written about like I said in 1990 so don't be hating on Trump and understand what's really going on like Dr. Dre told y'all niggas in the chronic anyhow <laughs> I'm not gonna apologize because uh, for saying the n-word because the name of my tribe is very similar to that word <laughs> In India, so uh, all you political correctness uh, pricks can, you know, go take a flying, you know what. So this is a war, and it's like the barbarian raids. This immigration crisis is a war. It's uh, like the barbarian raids when Europe was defeated and sank into the dark ages. I don't know if it was really that bad, for dark for the people who were living there, <laughs> the common people, because uh, after the so-called Great Industrial Revolution, that's when a lot of the psychological and societal suffering began, I think, because people were living more uh, removed from nature. But now he gets to the good stuff. So there is, but there is, uh, so I'm going to begin reading at 8 minutes, 12 seconds. But there is an even um, more ominous and less visible threat on the horizon. It has to do with the very warp and woof of the New World Order and its liberal ideology of consumerism and pluralism. The essence, essence of both democracy and the market is choice. Both, offer, both democracy and the market offer the citizen-consumer the right to adopt or reject options, candidates, commodities, politicians, products. So choice, this is what consumerism and this uh, pluralism is all about. To uh, re-elect or vote out of power, hire or fire, change management or shift investment. This capacity to change all these things is the principal feature of the culture of choice on which the consumerist consensus rests. But look at what he's saying. Capacity to change or reverse or alter or switch policies, people and products. And I remember from Toastmasters how... Uh, some of the, uh, some of the, um, I think they were like home, uh, live at home, stay at home moms, uh, who would, uh, well, it was just one, I think, who would make this comment about how, um, you know, friends are better than family or, you know, friends are cool, whereas family, whatever, because you don't have a choice with, uh, family, but you get to choose, choose your friends, which is true, of course, but I mean, if you believe in God, you would think that, you know, uh, your family is also kind of <laughs> uh, important. Anyhow. Um, but yeah, um, in this new uh, millennium, he's saying people are going to have 
options, whether candidates or commodities, politicians or products, which means they can have the capacity to change or reverse or alter or switch policies, people and products. So products, people, and even um, attitudes and you know thoughts and so forth, or even um, policies, I guess, decisions in your life. All these three things are kind of disposable today, and uh, uh, if you really think about it, it's really true. So um, that's what the consumerist consensus is all about. And this was 1991. If you really know what's going on, uh, and you look around and you're aware and conscious, you'll see that it it hasn't <laughs> gotten any less tragic than back then. So uh, let's keep going. It informs this. Um, economic uh sorry it informs our political system and our economic order this choice and pluralism and so forth both are rooted in pluralism this political system and economic order and what might be called the principle of reversibility we have come to believe that nothing is forever so this is what i was just talking about everything can be exchanged or discarded it's the short term um, even though this principle is convenient in the short term it cannot anchor a civilization. That's what I mean. It's uh, he just talked about how there's the barbarian raids about to happen and happening, and we are about to. Or I pretty much think we're in dark ages because I mean I can't even make a joke about um, uh, or any anything topic that might be racial or might be gender or you know uh, you can't even uh, freely talk about these things and uh, especially like in uh, fields where uh, it's supposed to be like. Uh, you know smart people together and education and so forth it's it's a total joke so we're pretty much in dark ages and uh we're just seeing the barbarian raids on the news and uh it's not gonna get any better we're gonna get we're gonna become mexico obviously if they're gonna make half the country mexico uh, obviously the economic economy is so bad that um we can't sustain on our own and uh we definitely can't do that biologically because we don't have kids but um, yeah, also uh, it's gonna bring that culture here, and uh, probably gonna bring the econo I mean, economy here too, slowly or at least partially. So um, let's keep going. We cannot anchor this way with this principle. He's saying, indeed, it undermines the chief imperative of all previous civilizations to endure, whether ruled by blah 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 blah. Previous civilizations have generally acted under the sign of stewardship. Native Americans always thought about the seventh generation, uh, seventh unborn generation, while organizing their society. But we don't even think about the people who are involved today. Uh, but let me not add too many comments. Past leaders or rulers tended to think in terms of centuries, not in terms of quarterly earning reports or electoral cycles. Octavio Paz, uh, I love this quote, has said that while primitive civilizations so Octavio Paz, who was a Latino thinker, I think he's from Mexico. He says that while primitive civilizations lasted for millennia, which is why I think tribal, tribal people are superior to our so-called advanced civilization, which is just advanced ways to kill. Um, while primitive civilizations lasted for millennia, modern civilizations, which idolize change, explode within two or three centuries. So he's saying that this is pretty much... Uh, the standard lifespan of modern civilizations. So if you think about it, it's kind of true. Uh, because uh, if I think about the Mughal Empire, which was, I think, a modern civilization because it had banking, it had, um, uh, it had like a class system, it had uh, favoritism and divided and ruled. So modern civilization, Mughal Empire lasted like 500 years maybe or 700 years. Um, so I guess it wasn't a modern civilization because it still had a religion to uh, anchor it, a different philosophy. Um, I can't really think of a modern civilization unless I'm um, thinking of like, yeah, I really can't. I really don't know what he means by this or I don't know history well enough to give an example right now of uh, something that lasted only two or three centuries as a civilization. But um, I guess it's true because um, all these revolutions that we see are just the... Uh, birth of a new modern civilization because before this we had the industrial civilization where working is good but today we have this uh dark age where <laughs> there's no job you know <laughs> so uh, anyhow um yeah i guess that's true
Setra Milso, uh, Milos worries that the nihilistic indifference resulting from the constant flux of change has left Western civilization running an exhaustive race between disintegration and creativity, hardly surviving from decade to decade. So this is what I kind of uh, I'll always um, bemoan or complain about, I guess. Uh, and I don't see myself as complaining. I see myself as trying to bring awareness to an issue, which uh, it's taboo to even talk about, where, you know, uh, things that I talk about, like feminism or something, all we're seeing is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, disintegration and uh, hardly surviving civilization from decade to decade. So you can't really complain about how the people don't have any uh, values and uh, common sense, you know. The social vertigo induced by the principle of, of reversibility, which sanctifies the short term and makes a cult of immediacy. <laughs> I remember there was a president of our Toastmasters Club. Oh my God, she would, uh, she, she, this was her uh, life philosophy, you know, um, <laughs> that uh, if you waste my time, you're my enemy. Uh, you know, he, she was promoting this mindset where, you know, uh, while, while we were, which is good. I mean, she was trying to uh, improve our uh, time management skills, I guess, but. Uh, uh, in in a general sense, to put a message where you know um, uh, my time is valuable, and uh, we spend some time, and it, it goes away, and you know, and women tend to have this because you know they uh, they now they only think of themselves as sex objects, and everybody thinks of them as sex objects because mother uh, mothering is evil, just like in the Brave New World. So um, you know these uh, these little girls, they uh, I don't know what I was trying to say, but. Uh, I'm just tired of holding this phone like this. <laughs> um, yeah, but the feminism uh, is what I was saying. Is uh, yeah, it's a, it's a symptom of the decaying civilization, uh, and uh, and yeah. So my president, she would say that you know um, I don't like to waste anybody's time because time is the only resource, which once you spend it never comes back. You know. Like there's like there's like only fifty dollars in our bank account. I mean, sure, we only have sixty years to live or eighty years to live, but um, you know, to um, I I still think there's life beyond this and in a different way. You know, obviously, um, it makes sense to me. It feels natural, but um, even even you know, to create a culture where everybody's just Russian, Russian, Russian. It's uh, and that woman you could tell because she was uh, she was definitely had a lot of uh, fire in her body. She didn't know how to check her attitude, you know. It's fire in her mind. She, I mean, her face was always red, <laughs> for goodness sakes. And she's here, Russian, Russian, Russian in life, and uh, you know, thinking her, her every second is like, uh, like uh, it, I mean, it's not good to waste time, but I mean, to uh, take it slow also has a lot of benefits. I mean. You can't really think uh, if you're Russian through life, uh, just doing things all the time. Anyhow, so yeah, this social vertigo induced by this culture and this cult of immediacy is provoking reaction and religious fundamentalism is a reaction uh, to this. And uh, I was just thinking about Bin Laden and 1984. <laughs> How uh, Bin Laden is kind of like the... Uh, Goldstein, you know, Goldstein was a Jew because that's who they hated back then. But in the nineteen nine, uh, in the millennium, new millennium, in the first decade, they, uh, Muslims were the target. So, um, yeah, so Bin Laden was like uh, the Emmanuel Goldstein of nineteen eighty four in in Bush's America. But uh, yeah, so uh, religious fundamentalism is uh, rising in the East and the West. Obviously, Trump is a just an example of that. Uh, and then the fanatical rejection of industrial life by radical ecologists is the same thing. The nostalgia for hierarchical social structures and traditions is the same thing. And this is all the specter that the democ democratic values and market principles inherent in the culture of choice will be constantly attacked, perhaps even overturned. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, anti-materialist sentiment today. Uh, not today, but um, there used to be at least <laughs> when the millennium was coming around, and that's why religious fundamentalism was so deep, um, and still is pretty deep. But it's I think that the religious uh, strength of uh, humanity today is uh, has become weaker since like thirty years ago when I was a baby. But uh, definitely in the last decade or fifteen years, you've seen it happen for the worse. So.
So um, he's talking about some examples of nightmare scenarios where this millennium will end up like the eco dictatorship under a charismatic green despot, which I think is very likely. Uh, Hillary was about to be that, but thankfully <laughs> we stopped her. But um, the next one is probably going to be an eco dictator, a soil and green style. And then we have Solonitsyn's backward Slavic Republic, which is also where America is headed in a way with the communist uh, culture that we have right now. Then uh, the nihilistic alienated consumer society might well trigger, trigger a revolt of considerable force and popular appeal. So yeah, he's saying uh, there's a danger in this uh, new world order culture. So let's go. To avoid this possibility, as he is a uh, politician or he's down with this whole civilization concept, to avoid this possibility, the market and democracy will have to be bound. They must be circumscribed, not by conservative values that preserve the past, but by conserving values that preserve the future. Oh, how beautiful, right? So he wants us to conserve values which preserve the future, but hey, I don't know if you know the story of Jesus and the two robbers, but uh, there's two people crucified next to Jesus in popular pictures. And those are the robbers of the past and the future that prevent you from living the present. So um, that's what these, uh, these intellectuals never really discuss is how to live in the present. Always talking about, oh, we must preserve the future with conservative values. <laughs> Such as uh, you can't collect water on your roof or, you know, uh, freaking Oregon State did that. Or uh, you can... Uh, you can marry dogs because we don't want kids. There's too much population. So go ahead and marry a dog, uh, Miss uh, Miss Tang. And that woman was pretty too. It's, uh, it's funny how they put that article up. And it's funny how they censored my article and took it off Facebook. Because I was talking about a uh, Scandinavian woman uh, marrying a dog. And it being legalized in, uh, I think it was Sweden. But anyhow, um, the culture of choice must not be allowed to embrace processes that would irreversibly alter and transform the core of life itself through tinkering with the coding of DNA or by continuing to destroy the rainforests, which will ultimately strip the planet of its diverse genetic heritage. These essential processes of life must be regarded as a sanctuary, a sacred preserve of the essence, essence of life. If you are to salvage a livable world from the new one that is emerging and avoid the growth mania that may well make civilization itself the grand loser of the next millennium. So look at here. I mean, he's saying, uh, careful how you move with your plans because uh, civilization itself could be destroyed by this real religious uh, radicalism or uh, religious fundamentalism and uh, this uh, hatred towards this uh, anti-human culture of... Uh, of, um, of uh, liberal pluralism and the culture of choice, consumerist consensus. Um, um, so I like, uh, I like, I make a lot of, uh, I make a lot of uh, sounds, uh, filler words while I'm speaking, as you've noticed, like uh and um, and maybe you know. But um, if you uh, think about sound therapy, these are actually. Uh, sacred sounds like ah uh, or ooh or mmm which combined makes om. So um, the different sounds have different effects on your physiology and that's why we subconsciously do them when we speak uh, such as ah uh, which stimulates alertness ah uh, like Christians do every day and uh, mmm kind of like a humming meditation which uh, yogis do which is supposed to be more towards uh, not strengthening the core of your body or the uh, energy part of your body, but more the uh, thinking part of your body, the brain part, the top part, the skull. <laughs> That's what they say. It's just it's kind of like a it's more philosophy maybe than uh, actual science, but uh, it does have a lot of uh, observations about uh, the world and our bodies. So anyhow, um, yeah, I think uh, it's all a mental exercise that we do with these sounds. Because uh, humans would just be like, oh, oh, ah, to communicate anyhow in uh, nature without language. But, uh, you know, or, yeah.
they would do it more. They have a lot of tone, so that we can communicate very well just with that. And words are just 5% of communication anyhow. So we cannot permit, so in order to, uh, we should understand, they should, these rules of um, political economy and global balance of power must be rooted in our understanding of the history of civilizations and of the cultural mutation of the human, of the future being brought about by radical technological innovation. So he's saying psychology is very important and uh, history and political science is very important in this new millennial age. We cannot permit ours to become an age that pushes and fairly transgresses the limits of the human condition, a condition bound in all previous civilizations.